In this video, we're going to be doing what we've been talking about doing for a while now, solving polynomials. So we got to use all of those factoring methods that we just discussed in the previous videos to actually solve polynomials. Mm -hmm. So let's start with an example. And if I have 2x to the third minus 3x squared minus 10x plus 15 and I'm asked to solve this so I want a value for x what are the possible values of x usually when we solve polynomials there's going to be more than one value this is a 10 right here sorry um, and also what I want to do is kind of point out why I'm choosing the method that I'm choosing for each example so this first example here it has four terms um, that is one clue to let you know that perhaps it's a grouping factoring pattern that we could use. So let's try it out. Um, if I group the first two terms here, let's take out the greatest common factor. It's going to be basically just x squared, right? And that leaves 2x minus 3. Let's factor the last two terms. If I take out a negative 5, what does that leave me with? Let's see, 2x minus 3. Well, good. So our grouping method worked out. So let's group it up here. x squared minus 5 in one set of parentheses. And our repeated set of parentheses right there. All right. To solve, right? To solve is where we set our equation equal to 0. Um, this is in place of y, so wherever our y value is 0, that's going to give us our x-intercepts, right? So we set each set of parentheses equal to 0. And when we're solving polynomials, you want to take any part of your equation here, any part of the factored form that has the variable in it, and set that equal to 0, and I'm going to explain that a little bit further in another example here. So it's just these two sets of parentheses for this one. We've got x squared minus 5. We'll set that equal to 0. And we'll also do 2x minus 3 and set that equal to 0. If we add 5, we have x squared equals 5. And then if we square root both sides, we have x is plus or minus the square root of 5. So there's two, two answers, right? we got the positive square root of 5 and the negative square root of 5. Um, if we add 3 to both sides here, we get 2x equals positive 3. And if we divide by 2, well then x is, oops, 3, that's a 3. Let me do that neater. Dividing both sides by 2, right? So we get 3 halves. So, three different values. We have 3 halves, or 1.5. We have positive square root of 5 and we also have the negative or opposite of the square root of 5. So three different values for x that will make this equation equal to 0. Okay. Alright, let's try out another example, see if we can try out some other factoring techniques. Um, let's try this one. x to the fourth plus 7x squared plus 10. I think we actually factored this in our last video here. Um, so here you see we only have three terms. Um, so that's generally a good reason not to group. Um, when we group we need four terms. So it's not a grouping factoring pattern. Um, it's similar to a quadratic. It looks almost like a quadratic. So I'm thinking if we create a quadratic, use our z, and create a quadratic there, then we can factor and solve it. Well, if z equals x squared, then we can say z squared plus 7z plus 10. And now we have a quadratic. Let's set it equal to 0 and factor and solve. So just using our x technique, or thinking we want the factors of 10 that add up to 7. And that's 5 and 2, both positive. And we're using z for now, so let's replace that. We want x, right? So 
instead of z, I want to use my x squared. z equals x squared. So everywhere there's a z, replace x squared. Okay. And now if I set that equal to 0, or set each of my sets of parentheses equal to 0, then I can solve. So x squared plus 5 equals 0, and x squared plus 2 equals 0. If we subtract 5, well, then x squared is negative 5. And so if we square root both sides, well, we're dealing with an imaginary number at that point. We're square rooting a negative number. Um, so x is plus or minus the square root of negative 5. Um, that's the same as plus or minus 5i. Okay, so there's two values right there. Let's do this one. x squared, if we subtract 2, we get x squared equals negative 2. And again, another imaginary set of values here. If we square root both sides, we get x is plus or minus the square root of negative 2 or plus or minus 2i. So really, x has four different values now. I'll just write them up here. x could be positive 5i. It could be negative or the opposite of 5i. It could be positive 2i and the opposite or negative 2i. So four different values, all imaginary. So occasionally, um, directions for a problem will ask for real number solutions, in which case this polynomial has no real number solutions. They're all imaginary. It's kind of weird. All right, let's do another one. So we have done grouping. We've done creating a quadratic. Let's see if we can come up some other methods here. Solving polynomials. Uh, here's a good one. 2x to the fifth plus 24x equals 14x to the third. So this is a 5. Let's make sure that's there. All right, so first, we always want to get all of our terms onto one side of the equal sign here. So let's, let's move this 14x to the third by subtracting it from both sides. And when I put it over on my other side, I want to make sure and put it in order of powers. So this needs to come next. So negative 14x to the third on the other side. We still have the positive 24x, and now we have 0 on the right side. All right, let's see. Let's think about what, what method do we want to use to solve this. So we don't have, we don't have four terms, so let's not group it. Um, doesn't look anything like a quadratic, so I'm thinking we can't turn it into a quadratic. So ideally, what we would always want to do is check for a greatest common factor first, um, because occasionally, by taking the greatest common factor of all your terms, it will become clear what method to use. So because these all have an x, I'm thinking I could take that out. Um, because they're all even numbers, I could also take out a 2, and that seems to be the greatest common factor, 2x. So if I take that out of each term or divide each term by the greatest common factor, what's left over? This would be x to the 4th. This would be 14x. Oops. Took out a 2, so half of 14. That would be minus 7x squared and plus 12. Okay. If I distribute... My 2x, I should get back to where I started. So always check yourself as you're going. Now I have something that kind of looks like a quadratic. I could probably change it pretty easily. So I'm going to keep that 2x on the outside. And I'm going to use z. So x to the fourth would be z squared. Uh, 7x squared would be 7z. And we still have positive 12. And if I factor this using my x factor, or just asking myself what factors of 12 add up to negative 7. So 2x is still on the outside. We know we're going to have z in each set of parentheses, and what factors of 12 add up to negative 7. Well, let's see, 6 and 2, that doesn't do it. 4 and 3, if I made 4 negative and I made 3 negative, then they would multiply to give me positive 12, but add up to give me negative 7. So now all I have to do now is uh, rewrite everything with my x squared instead. So x squared minus 4, uh-oh, 
talk about that in a sec, x squared minus 3. Here we have another difference of squares, so I gotta continue to factor. So I got 2x on the outside, but now this breaks up into two sets of parentheses. This is a difference of squares factor pattern. We got x minus 2 times x plus 2. And we still have this x squared minus 3 on the outside. Alright, so check this out. We're not done, but I just want to emphasize what we're doing next. Here's our final factored form. And like I said before, we want to take any term that has x and set it equal to 0. So not only am I setting each of my parentheses equal to 0, now I got this guy on the outside. It also has an x, so I want to set this equal to 0 as well so that I can get all of my values for x. All right, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to bomb it and rewrite it starting up at the top here. Oh, we got 2x, x minus 2, x plus 2, and what else do we have there? x squared minus 3. Oops. Alright, there we go. Set it all equal to 0. So I got 2x equal to 0. I have x minus 2 equal to 0. x plus 2 equal to 0. And x squared minus 3 equal to 0. I gotta solve for all of those. So here is pretty easy. If I divide by 2, I just get 0. So there's a possible value for 0. If I add 2 here, I get positive 2, so that's pretty easy. If I subtract 2 here, I get negative 2, so there's another easy one. So this is the last tricky one to do. If I add 3 to both sides, then I get x squared is equal to 3. And then if I square root both sides, I get x equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. So how many different values do I have here? 0 could be a value. Positive and negative 2. And positive square root of 3 and the opposite of the square root of 3. So five different values there. All of them work. It's crazy. All right. Let's try one more. So again, GCF first as much as possible and then keep going. 2y to the fifth minus 18y. Set it equal to 0. GCF first if possible. Well, I notice that 2 and y can come out. So that leaves y to the fourth minus 9. Um, hopefully by now you recognize this is a difference of squares and we don't have to use z anymore. It's just y squared minus 3 and y squared plus 3. So that equals 0. So again, each term or each um, expression that uses the variable y has to be set equal to 0 to get all of the values. So 2y equals 0, y squared minus 3 equals 0, and y squared plus 3 equals 0. This, if we divide by 2, y is 0. If we add 3, then y squared is equal to positive 3. And if we square root both sides, y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. Over here, if we subtract 3, then y squared is equal to negative 3. And if we square root both sides, we get plus or minus the square root of negative 3. So that is plus or minus 3i. All right, so all of our values for y, we got 0, uh, the positive square root of 3, the opposite of the square root of 3, the positive... 3i and the opposite of 3i. So a couple imaginary values and a couple real values. So again, if it asks for the real values, then we ignore these imaginary ones and only deal with the real number solutions. All right, but that's ideally all of the solutions there. So good luck solving polynomials using all of those techniques.